Thank you all for joining us. It's good to see all of our panelists from Occupy the Farm. Um, we're here to commemorate the 50th Earth Day, 2020, and the land action known as Occupy the Farm that was taken to save the Giltrack Farm in the East Bay of Northern California. Um, today, eight years ago, 200 urban farmers walked up to the gates of a publicly owned research farm clipped the lock off the fence, walked on with 15,000 seedlings and planted two acres of crops in order to save a, the, the land from becoming a real estate development. Uh, it wasn't a small action. It was, this was not just local news. It was a very symbolic thing and it, uh, it has had uh, a, sent a powerful message around the country. And eight years later, the farm is still working, growing food and, uh, and ongoing. So I'd like to, uh, First, start with uh, with everyone going around and introducing themselves. Uh, we'll start with uh, with Effie because she was the one who first came up with this idea. Thanks, Todd. Um, I'm Effie, and uh, I was a part of um, the whole shebang, as Todd mentioned, and um, I'm still farming at the Giltrax uh, eight years later. The first Earth Day since that Earth Day that I haven't been at the at the Gill Tract actually, um, but the farm is still going strong and growing all the time. Ryan, you want to go next since you're next to me on the little squares? Yeah, sure. My name is Ryan Rising. Um, I'm in the Bay Area, California. I currently work with the Permaculture Action Network. Um, I was involved with. Occupy Wall Street and then Occupy San Francisco um, and peripherally Oakland before the farm. So I kind of got to see the transition from those moments into Occupy the Farm uh, starting on Earth Day 2012. And then following that, I've been involved with uh, an organization where we essentially mobilize people from cultural events um, to days of direct action, building out regenerative community spaces, much like the Guilt Track. Um, so I've tried to continue the kind of work that we started together of regenerative land-based, place-based projects where people are creating um, autonomy um, and creating a just transition uh, through taking direct action with the land. And I'll pass it to Gopal. Hi everybody, my name is Gopal Dainani. I live here in Oakland on ceded Ohlone territories along the Temescal Creek. Uh, watershed, which has been paved and culverted, and but still reminds me that there's water flowing. <clears throat> and uh, um, I am um, part of Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project, and was involved in the um, initial occupation, and um, continued to do work around food systems, food sovereignty, um, and a host of other. Um, ecological concerns. And I just want to say it's just really nice to see everybody's face. It's been a while for some folks. Some of us have been in more communication than others, but um, it's nice to, to be reconnected and, um, and just really um, value the learnings from that time and, um, and the impact that the experience and all you all have had on my life. So I'm happy to be in conversation today. And I'll pass it to Anya. Everybody, um, my name is Anya Ganskaya, and um, directly after uh, participating in this wonderful action, I uh, moved f more concretely from farm work to uh, organizing around water access and spent four years as part of a, a cooperative business that installed small scale water recycling systems for people across the Bay Area, and I've since transitioned to work for a very centralized local water agency to kind of see what, how things work from the inside to understand large scale water distribution systems better and to see um, how to influence them for the betterment of things like mutual aid and unhoused people. Mm -hmm. And I'll pass it to Christoph. Um, hi, uh, my name is Christophe Lefour. Uh I also live in Oakland, and uh, I've been organizing at the farm since eight years ago. I'm still there. Uh, I was just there yesterday. Um, and 
I think like FBA is probably my first first day not on the farm. Um, uh, what about, what else do I do? Um, I've also organized locally on a number of different projects. I most recently um, organized with the Anti Police Terror Project in Oakland, and um, currently, uh, aside from the Gill Track, I have a few land based projects going on. And right now, I'm trying to focus on mutual aid and food distribution um, in sort of the post COVID 19 world. Check Ashoka. See, yeah. Uh, my name is Choka. Yeah, what have I been doing since the farm? Uh, I've mostly got involved in a lot of work around coordination and collaboration. So I was working on crypto systems and thinking about how we scaffold new systems of trust in the face of a really, and so how can we build new economies? Um, that allow us to collaborate and coordinate across space and time. Um, and most recently I've been working on a land-based project just outside of Hudson uh, to convert a couple hundred acres into a generative community. Um, and I've also been doing a lot of work around emergent strategy. I do emergent strategy facilitation and thinking about how to build more dynamic uh, coalitions and um, processes for people who are looking to change the world. And my name is Todd Darling. I was fortunate enough to make a film about these people and about Occupy the Farm. And um, if you don't know this story, uh, you can take a look at OccupyTheFarmFilm.com to watch a four minute trailer. It'll give you sort of a brief outline of what the story is about. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the Giltrack Farm and the place where I'm sitting is on Olani territory and the Ohlone people um, are involved to a, an extent at, at the Giltrack Farm. The Segorite Land Trust is operating there and that's an organization that's run for and by uh, Ohlone people. Um, and we're all grateful to be here. Um, so, the pandemic uh, has uh, jolted everything and everybody. And is, besides Earth Day and the anniversary, it's as much we're here to talk because of the pandemic. Um, it's one of those things that um, has affected everyone. And I hope that everyone out there is safe. But to be sure, the pandemic has taken the flaws and prejudices of our system and turned them to be much more deadly than they were before. And so I hope everyone out there is safe. Um, we're going to start this conversation with some fairly big questions, uh, and uh, towards the end, we'll talk about what people are doing right now, what people can do in terms of mutual aid to help people at risk, and about what we think this all pretends for the future. Um, much of the discourse in social and mass media has kind of reflects the guy who's in the White House. It's like uh, this sort of hysterical soap opera, and the anger, the justified anger that many people feel about the situation we're in, sometimes crowds out us considering what the pandemic has revealed about ourselves, about how we live, what we value in our lives, and what we might want to see created. Um, and I think that the, you know, the, the chaos created by the, uh, is a siren going by? I'm gonna pause a second. I don't know if the sirens drown me out or not. The chaos, the, the, the chaos created by this total lack of coordinated national response and you know the obviously rigged efforts to save the economy and the alarming consequences of racism that has apparently made black and brown people the disproportionate victims of this pandemic is all true and is totally objectionable. But I would like you know, take this opportunity to, to focus our creative energy in thinking about not just what's wrong at this moment, but also what possibilities does this moment, you know, give us. So when all of you guys walked on to the Gill Track Farm eight years ago, you talked about resilience. And I was familiar with the word resilience, but you framed resilience in a way that I'd never really thought about it before. And now with the pandemic, the 
concept of resilience has to be on everyone's mind. I mean, it's like, where do I get my food? Where do I get my power? What happens if dot, dot, dot? So suddenly resilience is uh, it, it's becoming a, a focal point for people and certainly for me. Um, so I would like to hear how you guys look back on your experience of having taken this action to save a piece of land in the name of resilience so now, how do you thought that now? Gopal was the uh, person who stood on a truck with a bullhorn and urged people to go through the gate and farm. So we'll start with Gopal. How you view resilience now? Um, well, let's just start by making sure we're all clear that, that, that these folks made me do it. So <laughs> I don't know that it's really <clears throat> fair to... <laughs> <laughs> pin me with that. I, I think it might have even been Christoph who just at the last minute threw a cowboy hat on me or um, <laughs> a farm hat on me. So I didn't look enough like a farmer, um, <clears throat> which quite honestly I'm not. Um, I've um, often said, um, uh, and I think folks, well, I'm just kind of repeating myself, but I've, I've said a lot over the years. Um, uh, some people were in it for the farming and some people were in it for the organic agriculture and some people were in it for um, fighting the university and I was in it for the land reform. And, um, and so that, I, I think that is actually an important part of the question of resilience. Um, I, think, I think the experience really deepened my view of resilience, which is that it isn't simply about um, just quote unquote bouncing back. It's about being clear on what the identity of the community, of the ecosystem, of the um, that the of the biotic community um, and and the social community is that we are attempting to defend and protect and be resilient in the face of um, of uh, disturbance disturbance. Um, and I, th when you think of resilience, not just in terms of like maintaining a status quo, but getting clear on what it is you are actually trying to preserve the identity of, it allows you to, to think differently about community and about, um, and about how you go about doing that. I think one of the key things that we're experiencing in this moment that we're learning and that we really attempted to, to um, apply at the, um, on the farm um, was, was about a, well, um, uh, uh, was this um, recognition that diversity is our best defense. Diversity in seed, diversity in food crops, diversity in ideas, diversity in participation. Um, and the more radically inclusive we can be, um, in particular, um, uh, and, and the more diversity we can have, the more resilient we will be. And I think that is an important lesson for this moment centralized, um, concentrated, vertical um, uh, systems are, um, are precarious um, and actually the rigidity makes them fragile in moments like these. And decentralized, distributed, democratic, community-controlled systems are way more resilient in, the, in moments like these, which is why we see peasant farmers in the Philippines self-organizing to ensure that poor folks in the city are getting food. Um, this is why we um, are seeing people immediately and intuitively lean into how do we um, come together in our communities and grow food? How do we think about growing food? How do we think about ways of getting our needs met? Because we intuitively understand that throughput industrial um, systems are going to be more deeply disrupted in this moment than the short chain, known chain, or, sh or food webs that we can weave together, just as an example. Um, it's really no different than 2008 financial crisis, which sparked Occupy, which sparked Occupy the, the farm in many ways, which is, you know, the financial system collapsed because of its um, rigidity and um, uniformity. And the financial, um, the, the vehicles, um, financial vehicles that fared the best were cooperatives, community lending circles, um, non -ex Act of finance, those kinds of models actually survived that financial crisis better and, and weathered the, transit, the, the storm better. And it's true in food, it's true in energy, and it's true in our, um, in our social relationships as well. 
<laughs> I don't know if that answered the question at all. No, it definitely did. Uh, and I think that the, uh, the notion that these centralized functions are, are overly rigid, I mean, this is sort of written into the, the DNA of this whole pandemic. I mean, if, if we had not, you know, the, to a certain extent, we've concentrated so much manufacturing in one place, and if there's a hiccup in that one place, it's transmitted to the rest of the world. I mean, it's, and now, and we're left, you know, flat footed in our response. I, I would like to say we've been joined by Will Smith, who is at the Giltrack farm right now uh, on a cell phone, it looks like, and masked up doing work. Uh, Will, um, we were just talking about the role of resilience at um, and the farm, and you are there now. If you could introduce yourself, please, and and uh, tell us, tell them. I don't know you're you're working right now, so we'll we'll go to you next with uh, what the farm means, the guilt track means to you in terms of resilience. Um, well, hey everybody. Um, sorry for being late. Definitely been busy for sure, but yeah, I mean the guilt track. Is a, is a resource right now, which kind of goes down to like what resiliency, in my opinion, means is like being being prepared for moments like these um, and being being open for the community to, to have this as a resource. And I guess like I'm still reflecting on like, I guess how Giltrack can connect to that in deeper ways. But I think, um, yeah, like having having a system planned out for this which I think um, the, the person speaking before me was alluding to is like having democratic systems where people on the ground are making the decisions about how food is being grown and distributed and used um, for, for the path is, is, the key, is the key part. I think, you know, having, having the people here right now and deciding if it's how to be safe and how to safely distribute food and um, kind of weighing the pros and cons of it um, our, ourselves is really, is really crucial and important, you know, like we could easily say that, you know, because for the safety of the people, we want to, we want to take a step back and not distribute food, but uh, we know we're We all know that together now are, are like slowing down and like you know and that and that's fine too is like to to have a realistic idea of how many people we can help right now is really important to not also burn ourselves out during this moment too so it's just like a really fine balance but I think it goes back to just like being able to tap in with the people you're working with and being like okay what are we what are we doing how are we doing this in the most efficient way. And how are we also meeting our needs too? As the people doing this work, like how are we also understanding that like we're heavily impacted by this as well. And like we need space and time to rest and to heal and to, to do all the things that make sure, makes it so we can do this work long-term. Um, but that, that's, a, that's a packed question. Like you could go on all day about what resiliency means, but at this moment, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. um, Afi, that you work on the farm with Will um, actively on a, pretty much day-to-day -day basis we've seen uh, you know farmers dumping food and all across the country and at the same time people lining up by the thousands at food banks and, and the food banks running out of, out of food um just going on from what will says what how do you feel about resilience on the farm and what's going on there right now hmm. um well i think that it's, I've been really um, happy to see how, how our community has responded. You know, we, we asked ourselves um, as, as stewards of this land that, that uh, it is committed to, to feeding people who would otherwise have trouble accessing fresh food and land itself, um, how can we meet this, this challenge in a safe way? And so we were able to collaborate um, amongst ourselves and our shared, shared knowledge and also um, with some food safety specialists to get to a point where we could still operate um, and 
start delivering food again. And of course it hit at a time when we should have been planting like crazy and weeding like crazy. So we're a little bit behind, but um, I think that organization that Will touched on a minute ago of us like knowing how we operate amongst ourselves and govern ourselves has been really, has been really key. And um, it sometimes feels clunky um, to have, uh, you know, these, these working groups of people where we share information and we share roles and there's some redundancy and there's some gaps. Um, but the, the, the practice that we've been doing in, in getting food out with, with very little funding, um, though we, we do have access to this land, which is, which is critical and why land reform is, is so key to communities being able to feed themselves um, in times like these. Mm -hmm. uh, and you do need to raise money. So this, in, for the effort to give the guild track the funds to raise money and raise crops and feed people, you can go to this website, which we will repeat a couple of times and give them money to, they need to grow more crops, feed more people, and for that they need money to, for staff, resources, seeds, transportation, what have you. Thanks, Todd. I like the cardboard sign, Todd. It's very reminiscent of the early days of Occupy. <laughs> or still today, we have cardboard signs around the farm. <laughs> Yeah, that's, you know, I can use it for something else later. It's a folder, so it's, uh... So, Ashoka, then uh, you're sitting there in, in what looks like Bart Simpson's hell uh, with your background. What, uh, how, how are you feeling about uh, looking back on the experience of, on, uh, of Occupy the Farm and, and resilience? You spoke at the time, you spoke eloquently, I thought, about, you know, developing the place as a as a hub for understanding the bioregion of the Bay and what would work there. Um, what, uh, what, what you're looking back on all this, what are your feelings now? Yeah, um, I, I'm super proud of what's happened. I like, I personally haven't been super involved in the farm since the time of the occupation. Um, and I think the, that experience really taught me about the importance of investigating all systems that we use and all systems that we are a part of in terms of resiliency. Uh, it, it goes much farther beyond food. Ryan and I actually gave a presentation about the longer a supply chain is, the less power we have in that supply chain. And so mm. like logistics is power in this current moment. And we, especially those of us who have access to whatever form of capital and and have money uh, mediate our relationships with for access to resources. Um, we are all understanding our own precarity in a way that I think that is is deepening my own understanding of like what this needs to become and what this moment is. I think like Arundhati Roy was talking about this idea of the pandemic as a portal and understanding where we move forward and through to and what we prioritize. I think that one thing that I've understood more deeply is that our capacity to govern ourselves is probably the most radical thing that we can do right now because we live in a society that shows a deep lack of governance and control. And so the easier we are, or the more capable we are to develop like alternative structures and resource sharing and mutual aid, the more legitimacy an alternative world has. I think that one of the bastions of kind of social change that people, um, like people know it's fucked, but don't want to go out into the streets because they're holding on to this idea of safety and and security that I think is really being eroded in moments like these. And so I think in the post pandemic world, I think it's a time to take more risks in terms of relationships to the state. I think it's a time to introduce ourselves to each other. I think it's a time to like recognize that you don't get to choose your zombie squad and everyone can be there with you. 
um, when we're walking the freeways, it would be ideal to have like, you know, all anarchists around me, but that's probably not going to be the case. And so how do we, how do we have some humility and engage people where they are and find points of commonality that allow us to build structures that survive, that help us to survive this moment, but also to help us survive generally. I think like this is kind of just a, a trial run for the next decade in terms of crisis. And so like, it's an interesting moment because we can't be together physically, but I think it allows us to prioritize other types of relationships and other types of interactions that might be fruitful for us in the future. Um, Anya? Anya, are you there? Do you read me, Anya? Yes, I'm just I'm having problems unmuting myself. Hi. Hey. So then looking back on, on, on your experience, um, you've dealt with, you, you dealt with uh, a, a lot of water issues and uh, water became the uh, sort of a focal point of the, of the farm. Um, and uh, it, it, in your work right now, if, can you explain a little bit about what happened on the farm about how water became a tool and, and and, uh, and what you think about the, the role of water as we're going forward? Well, water to me, outside of the initial day when we broke through the fence and started giddily harvesting up all of the mustard and making rose, water was, I'd say, one of the most unifying forces on the farm and pushed our strategy and forced our strategy to evolve in an extremely meaningful and impactful way um, because first we didn't have water um, and then we had some helpers helpers get us water connection established and then that connection got cut off by the university at some point and then we had all these little baby plants in the ground with no water and it was so like i'm getting shivers right now just remembering the incredible um, rallying that happened um, through the community of supporters both um, right around the farm and just everyone around the Bay Area trucks were pouring in with hundreds of gallons of water we were doing lines from the trucks to the field watering um, it was so um, I think it was one of my favorite symbols of the farm of how when tragedy strikes um, people can get really galvanized by it and instead of getting disorganized and combative actually really support each other in really beautiful ways and how um, uh, you can find allies and co-conspirators in kind of unlikely places and how sympathetic people can be during a tragedy or, a, or an intense moment I should say. Um, so that, that's really what water meant for me during the action was it's galvanizing power to bring people together into cooperation. Yeah, it's, it's the, uh, this, this moment, I mean, on a, on a global perspective of what we're going through. I mean, it's sort, of, it's sort of crazy that we didn't all see this coming. I mean, we've had, you know, we had the West Nile virus arrive here on an airplane. We had, you know, SARS, Zika, MERS, uh, by 2019, the, the, the water in the Gulf Stream had warmed up so much that tourists in Florida were dying of some kind of crazy microbe. And on the West Coast, the, the ocean had warmed up so much that major rivers like the Klamath and the Columbia did not see a very significant return of spawning salmon because the salmon died in the ocean. The, the ocean was so unhealthy. So we're really at a point where uh, th th we're teetering on the brink. And while we've been in, in, in quarantine, I sometimes think, and I would like you guys to, I want to find out what you think. I sometimes feel like uh, capitalism is teetering on the brink of, of driving itself into extinction. Uh, and then on the other hand, I think, or capitalism is, is on the point of becoming so efficient and so well, you know, Techno, you know, the technologies have become so uh, rampant that it's ready to sink its fangs into our neck and we're never gonna get away from it. I oscillate between these two, be, between these two points. Um, 
what are youth all thinking uh, along those lines in terms of how our economic system is in such contradiction to what we need to do to make this a livable planet? Ryan. Yeah, it's really interesting to look back from this moment uh, because I think this is what a lot of us were fighting for, right, during Occupy the Farm. Um, it was foreseeing moments like this. It was foreseeing bottlenecking in logistical systems or bottlenecking in systems of power that leads to a lack of resilience, right? Um, it was seeing that resilience and mutual aid aren't just things to respond with in a moment of crisis, but are actually the ways we should be designing our systems first and foremost. And it wasn't just the guilt tract, right? Like a lot of us were also struggling to save Hayes Valley Farm in the city from becoming condominium, but instead we lost that forest garden. A lot of us were fighting to save Kizar Gardens as a native plant nursery in San Francisco. Um, we would have gone on to try to fight for the free farm, which was providing food for people all around the Bay Area for free. But by that point, a lot of us who'd been through those struggles and had been, you know, violently attacked and shut down by the state time after time, we were either ready to give up or to, to become more militant in a way that wouldn't have provided, you know, fruitful for us. So um, we've been fighting for this for a while. And I think it's really interesting to look in these kind of moments and see that all of a sudden these ideas like mutual aid become ideas that get taken up by the mainstream. Um, I almost want to say they become recuperated, right, by folks that want to keep systems of power over and systems of extraction economically going, um, because this is what we were working towards, right? This is what the occupations were doing before Occupy the Farm, even. We were talking about mutual aid and the gift economy as the foundation of the kind of economic system we want to see. We weren't just saying, oh, you know, there's this 99%, 1% thing, and we need to make the economic system a little more fair. We were saying, hey, we can reorganize economy with mutual aid and the gift economy as its foundation. And then Occupy the Farm took that one step forward in this really amazing way. It said, okay, it's not just about mutual aid and gift economics and systems of distribution. Um, how do we actually become productive in that too? How do we actually take agency over space and over land to actually produce what we need and distribute what we need? Um, so this was exactly the kinds of thing that we were preemptively looking to design um, an economy that could, you know, could withstand in these kind of moments that would actually be better. Um, and, you know, we, we lost a lot of space over these struggles and over these years. And now we're at this moment where there's a crisis, um, a crisis that we've all seen coming in many different forms or that's been affecting us the entire time. And then mutual aid becomes this thing that we should look to for a short moment of the crisis to kind of save us. You know, New York Times is publishing about um, mutual aid networks that are popping up. But we, what we really need to be asking is, okay, how do we take this as a wake up call for those who weren't aware of it already? And how do we design in a way where mutual aid and resilience um, and local production and distribution of what we need to live in a cooperative way is the foundation of our economic system, not the thing that we use to hold it up in a short moment of crisis until we can go back to business as usual. Hmm. Um, Gopal, you've been doing, I guess, a good amount of work on internationally. Um, what's your perspective on this question? Gopal? So I think I heard you mouth my name, but the audio <laughs> cut out for me, so I didn't hear the question. I'll ask the question. Also, yeah, I just, I, I'm asking you to follow up on from what Ryan said, and, and, and you've been doing work internationally as well. To, to, what's your perspective on this? Oh, sorry. Um, also, we haven't been heard from Ashoka, who I'm really excited to hear a little bit more from. Um, uh, um, but um, I'll just say um, really quickly, and I think folks are frozen, so I don't know if I'm getting through. Um, we hear you. Okay, great. Um, and I didn't, I didn't hear you the first time. So just to say, um, I think there's something really important about um, recognizing that for some of us, we are trying to create or reper or, or or remember how to construct these kinds of um, 
really resilient community-based systems, but it is actually the defining feature of, um, uh, for a lot of communities of how um, they are actually organized. Um, so just to put it in a little bit of perspective around food systems, um, industri industrial agriculture controls um, 70% of the arable land on the planet like the agricultural lands on the planet and feeds less than 30% of the people and peasant agriculture and subsistence food systems control less than 25% of the land and feeds um, more than 70% um, of uh, the world's people. Even people in urban centers get the majority of their food needs, needs met through um, small scale um, subsistence agriculture. Um, and like most people don't know that. Right. And the industrial food system is incredibly, incredibly incapable of responding to this moment. Um, the, the, the solution to this moment is in, um, in those um, smaller scale decentralized systems. And that is, that is true around the planet. So La Via Campesina, the international peasant movement, one of their slogans is small farmers cool the planet. And what's interesting is some people hear that expression and think it's a, um, it's a like um, an invitation and in, it's like aspirational. Like if we had small farmers, they will cool the planet. But for La Via Campesina and for small farmers, it's actually the truth of the present that small farmers cool the planet and always have and have maintained um, the appropriate relationship between agroecological systems and, um, and human communities and human needs. And so I, I just, I want to name that um, the, 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 the answers we need are already here. They're all around us. Um, and, and I do, and I, and I think it, you know, I think it is important that we, um, that we figure out how to, how to implement them and scale them. And by scaling them, I don't mean just making things bigger. That's not the only way to get to scale, but we can aggregate gate to scale by connecting the solutions that we have in our communities. Um, and the question, you know, what Ryan was lifting up, I think is really important. How do we, how do we n move from a sort of disaster collectivism that can help us in this acute moment to, um, to what folks in, um, in the climate justice movement and folks in Puerto Rico and all over have been calling just recovery? How do we actually reimagine the economy so it meets those needs on an ongoing basis? The interesting thing is the thing that makes us more resilient in the face of these crises also changes our relationship to the problem such that it mitigates the, the problem in the first place. So something I, I wanna name around that is like um, this, you know, we hear a lot in the mainstream of the climate movement, like the, the, the time horizon, like we have 12 years um, or we have 10 years to peak emissions um, um, to avoid the worst implications of the climate crisis. Um, and it's sort of like, um, I understand where that urgency is, why, where that framing is coming from. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, we have 12 years to peak emissions to, to preserve what? And if we actually imagine ourselves transitioning to a different world and building that world, as we are doing it, as we are living into it, the very time horizon of change uh, the very time horizon changes. The very, our relationship to the problem is being transformed in every moment of our activity. And I think that's where I think there's really unique opportunities in these moments of crisis. And yeah, I don't know that it's, I, you know, I'm not going to say that it's the end of capitalism. I think there is a big change happening. I think, I think we may be approaching the end of neoliberalism and whether it gives way to a lawless libertarian capitalism or the waning of the American empire gives way to a new empire um, or whether a new form of um, uh, uh, or, an, or an uneven form of um, governance emerges that's um, in some ways more democratic, in some ways more decentralized. I think there are lots of possibilities um, coming out of the moment. Um, and I just, I just also want to say, and well, we haven't talked about this very much, but I want to I want to uplift that, like, um, you know, the the pandemic that we're for, the pandemic didn't didn't start in in 
in uh, Wuhan province. It, it arrives to us through industrial agriculture and deforestation, um, uh, and its origins are in colonialism and enslavement. This, this is not an unpredictable moment. This is the inevitable consequence of an economy based on the extraction of wealth from the living world and the exploitation of human labor and the erosion of living systems. Like this is the inevitable consequence. And people have been writing about it for a long time and saying that this is coming. And, and it's, it, the fact that we experience it as a shock doesn't change the fact that we knew it was coming. And, um, and we need to interrogate, even in social movements on the left, our own denial about the reality that we're facing now and the degree to which we did or didn't set ourselves up to navigate it um, well. Mm -hmm. I don't no, even know, I, I didn't even hear the question, so I just sort of went off the rails. You answered the question. And, uh, and I, I, did, I would like Ashoka to, to go ahead and pick up on this because you too, Ashoka, have worked all around the world in the last eight years and have some sense of this as well. And, and I, there's, there's no question that, that our in, intervention in the natural world has set us up for this. And, and Gopal is exactly right. He's like, yeah, of course, we, we should have seen this coming. And even if we did see it coming, it's still a shock. Um, right now, how does it put this in a perspective? The governor of California has set up a, a task force to reopen the economy. And he's asked, you know, Tim Cook of Apple and Bob Iger of Disney and people like that to be on the task force. And, and uh, I, I'm going to guess you haven't gotten your invitation yet to join it. But the, the, the task force to reimagine the economy is, is being <laughs> staffed by the people who most uh, are advantaged by the present arrangement. Um, you know, how, but Ashoka, what, from your travels, what is your view of this? I mean, yeah, I think that I think it's right to to name and know that the economy is not a monolith, and that this moment of crisis has been an ongoing experience for a lot of people. And in order to survive the ravages of this system. A lot of people have had to develop alternative economic models just to endure. Um, and yeah, really highlighting and centering those things. I think a lot of people are, are like I heard someone the other day being like, we should really make urban gardens. And I was like, you should really look at the 40 years of literature on it and maybe, <laughs> and then we can talk about it. But it's like, how do we, how do we lift up and highlight the solutions that people have been working on for a long time. How do we, um, how do we relate to, how do I relate to my own complicity in the ways in their non-intervention or their non-implementation? I think in a lot of ways, like my own habits support the economy as it is. And so how do I take stock of that and understand that I have access to resources and access to, um, capital that other people don't have and how do I really use this moment to put my money where my mouth is um and yeah I I love that idea that like living into the future we want to and that changing the narrative and the timeline and and moving away from this kind of like urgency based narrative um I would love to see yeah I would love to see people being really creative in this moment. Um, but yeah, I, I, do have, I do have my worries that people actually will get fatigued by the requirements of this moment and will be, will be super happy to return to life as it is. I know that people are like gonna be excited to go back to the bars and like, you know, do the whole, and, and before you know it, the cycle will, will start again and then we'll be in the same rapacious kind of economy. And so, yeah, I, I, I invite a pause right now and invoking this pause to, to really chart a course of, of what's important. What do we want to carry forward? What is possible to shed in this moment? Like, we, I feel like we're in this like fall slash winter phase of the tree of humanity and we're like getting rid of some things and, and there will be a moment to come back at, towards life. 
uh, and build an economy that values life rather than creating value from life. Um, and it's, we're really, we're like right there. We're like really right there. They're like, we don't need that many new solutions. We don't need that many like new innovative technologies. Like nothing needs to be that crazy for us to actually change the world that we're living in. It's just a lot of will and, and recognition that capitalism won't save you. Like the state won't save you. There's no one coming for you because at the end of the day, they don't care. And it's the quicker we realize that, the quicker we can, we can do what we need to do. And I think one of the powerful things of Occupy the Farm and actions like it is that the demand is the action. It's not an appeal. It's not asking anybody to do anything for us. It's just recognizing that with our collective power, we can do whatever we want. So let's decide what we want to do and do it. Will is uh, there at the farm right now and you know, working on the farm, trying to get a mutual aid effort uh, to expand it. Um, and picking up on what Ashok is saying, Will, can you talk about more specifically about what kind of, how does this, how are you shaping this mutual aid effort uh, and be able to talk about it as an example of what people can do? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, one, just acknowledging the fact that all the work that has been done during Occupy the Farm is why we can do this right now in the way that we're doing it. Like we're on university land still and, you know, they're not, they're not growing food at like the Oxford track or they're not doing anything on campus right now. Like we're not closed in the same way that the facilities on campus are right now. So just, you know, the result of having more, of, more not full autonomy, but more autonomy over this space is the reason why we're able to still distribute food to people and still be a resource for people um, looking for access to these things right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, all that being said is like, we're still taking all of the precautions and considerations to distribute food safely. So like, I mean, how it looks here is like every, you know, kind of kind of looks like it does in, in downtown. Like everyone has a mask on and we use gloves. Um, we desanitize everything. We have very like, um, organized processes over how we harvest, how we pack, and how we distribute food. So, in, you know, it looks a lot different than a regular day, day would. And right now, it's like a lot of people putting in more work than they usually have because volunteers can't be uh, received in the same way. But, but yeah, it's tough. Like, it's just definitely tough. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, getting, getting on the, this call was, um, was hard to do just because there's a lot, a lot of demanding things right now. And I think the communication piece right now is the biggest part of it. It's just like making sure that we're all communicating effectively and communicating efficiently to each other has been coming up a lot for me. Like even with the people that we're helping, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of people who, who can still take a step back because I think what has been alluded to is that like, I mean, as a collective, so I'm part of Black Earth Farms, which is using space at the Gill Tract, but is, is a collective of Black Indigenous youth um, in the Bay and in, in Los Angeles as well, but we're working to, to serve the most impacted communities. And so thinking about that rhetoric too, is like how we're always trying to serve the people who, who are most barred from these resources are in the most need of it right now and how that shifts, but also doesn't shift a lot really during these times and how it's really important for us to think about, you know, the things that need to be paid attention to always, like people thinking about, um, you know, their needs as like, a disabled person or someone who has an immunocompromised, um, who has, um, you know, lo lower um, immune system support. Like these are things they've always needed to think about. And these are people that we've always been trying to prioritize, but, you know, don't, don't always get thought about until times like these are, you know, don't always get considered or have accessible spaces until times like these too. So I think it's it's also been important to think about like what what our what community our farm serves as a whole, not just during these times, but out of these times, like going forward um, as a whole is like always trying to just really just a like question yourself and like what what is what I'm doing really or, or is it kind of contributing to the to the problem and also like 
um, like Paul was mentioning, like there, you know, the people who, who are, are doing um, this work have been doing the work and are still doing the work and have been doing the work for generations and, you know, thousands of years. Like our ancestors have been growing food and being in mutual aid and being in community for, for long, long before this. So I think it's just like, yeah, really trying to just like go back to something that has been working for longer than this capitalistic system has been, has been working, working on us. But um, the farm right now is like, it's just, you know, it needs a lot of help for sure. And so we're, we're currently like, that's our biggest thing is like how to safely receive volunteers, basically how to safely have gatherings of work done, which is like completely against the rhetoric that we're seeing or like be, or being pushed to stay home, to keep our distance, um, to like not to avoid gatherings while the farm is like, of course, listening to those things, but also being like, all right, but we need six people on the farm to like get, get stuff planted or to get harvesting done. So it's really like this this balancing work that the farm I think is doing right now and like really trying to take take steps forward but also take steps back to like really see what we're doing right now. But mm -hmm. but yeah. Mm -hmm. Um Effie, the, the organization there is is um is problematic, you know, because of the, the pandemic, but you guys have got to make but at the same time you ha are called upon to make a big leap, you know, ahead. Um what kind of challenges are you facing? Can I kick this one to Kristoff? You may. Kristoff, did you hear the question? Um, sorry, I, but, yeah, I did hear the question, but can you repeat it? Sure, uh, what kind of, uh, it, it, because of the pandemic, you were given a lot of handicaps to actually move forward, but the pandemic is also calling upon you to do more than you've ever done. So how are you, how are you, you know, what kind of needs do you have right now? What are your priorities in, in expanding the, the efforts of the farm? Um, well, I mean, the farm, we see the farm as part of what's being called essential services. Um, things that are necessary to continue, even in spite of any kind of shutdown. Um, and there are some efforts that people are making to expand what's going on at the farm. We're working on potentially expanding our food distribution. So, I mean, this kind of ties into some of your questions, um, about what's happening, uh, with regard to, uh, small farms and what's happening with regard to food banks. Um, but there is a hope that we can use our space and the fact that we've developed over these years m many links to food distribution networks in the Bay Area to help solve some of the problems of food insecurity and uh, and food shortages, which are actually coming down coming down the line. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I mean, did you want to talk about specific issues well, you guys, of the farm? You you probably need things, so why don't you well, let's let's talk about what you need, and so maybe some of the listeners can help you get some of the things you need. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, well, I'll I'll just say, um, and I'd love to hear from Will also on this. Uh, is that you know we have we do have um, some tools, and we have the amazing amazing generous earth, and um, the earth needs to get fed a little bit more than what we're feeding it right now. We have our own composting system, but at this time of year, we need a big boost. So we, um, we need compost, uh, organic compost. We need um, uh, some money to help with some staffing. Basically, you know, we want, we want, to, we want people who are just come as you are, you know, don't necessarily have a lot of high level skills in farming. We want them to be able to come and help. So that means that we need to have some staff folks that can help people plug in in a way that is useful. Um, so Will does that twice, at least twice a week. I do that several times a week, Christoph's doing it. Um, and so, yeah, we, we need that. Um, we need uh, transportation to get the, the food out. Um, a lot of that is just, you know, Will can speak to that a little bit more but it's like mutual aid who's got a truck in the community but you know unfortunately most of those are still running on gasoline so we need gasoline to go in the truck so 
we and we, we want folks to also like help get the word out um, and help share information and knowledge, share the story. Um, right now we've got a pretty simple and effective sim system in place. We just had an offer from someone, some mystery person to buy us a bunch of tools, which is great. Um, super awesome. So we're going to get a bunch of, a bunch of tools apparently. Um, Will, what do you think about, about what we, we, we would love to get more, um, more PPE. I know more masks and things like that. If people are making them at home, like, we would appreciate them at the farm because some people are having trouble getting access to, to masks. Yeah. Yeah, I think definitely emphasizing the money part, of course, just like having the funds to make sure that the people doing this work can still can still be supported and feel supported. Um, but for us, like the food distribution part, like it being done very like, of course, like cautiously, a lot of like packaging materials, like you know, plastic bags of different, different arrangements of sizes. Um, I think composting materials too, so not compost, but like if you know of someone who has a lot of greens or like a lot of coffee, coffee grains or something like that, that would be helpful too because of the restaurants that we've been usually tapping into um, aren't the, you know, aren't, aren't in process right now, so we can't get those in the same way. And then, um, yeah, I think, you know, besides all the things Effie mentioned, like really just like finding the networks of people who, who need assistance too, because like as much as we have a capacity to like to help people, we also want to, you know, be like really thinking about how we can help people in other ways too. Like, for example, we've just starting to give out starts. And so we're really like trying to find the networks of people who need extra starts. I mean, it hasn't been too hard. People want to take starts, of course. But like, if you know of like a community garden or a place that you feel feel like can benefit off that, please, you know, let us know. Um, and also, if you have excess starts too, that would be a good thing to think about as well, because we are, you know, can act as like distribution point for that as well. So if you have extra starts, extra seeds, extra produce, even I know it's been kind of hard, but if you have like stored goods like beans, rice, um, any legumes like onions, carrots, potatoes, stuff that can store a long time and that we can scrub down really good and wash and kind of keep um, keep in our shed or something that won't get moldy, but we can still distribute that as well. Like any any excess right now, any abundance that people have is is um, is received, and and we're grateful for that. One thing I want to jump in right there. Sorry, plug it, plug it, Todd. Here's the here's the website. Here's the website. You can donate at guildtrackfarm.org. Yes. Um, no, I just wanted to say, like, it also is a moment to think about things like housing and be, yeah, like, if you have an extra room in your house and you don't actually need the rent money, like, offer it to a farmer. Like, we can deepen the mutual aid that we're giving to each other in ways that can really develop the capacity of our social networks to sustain each other. Like, the le the more... The more like, the more resources we share, the less we need money, obviously, right? So if it's like we're sharing food and we're sharing housing and we're allowing, like we're having collective shares of vehicles and all of these things, it lessens the burden of like fundraising and all of the other like participations in the capitalist system as we know it. So it's like, there's not really anything to lose. So I know it, people weirded out by allowing strangers in their house and all sorts of things. But now is a great moment to share, like deeply share the resources we have and, and not try to price everything in dollars. Can I, can I jump in as well? Um, I, as everyone's been talking and, you know, Will, Will you said something about how times like these, um, you know, that's when the people that have been struggling for a long time due to some systemic injustices are kind of thought of and then if they're thought of at all and then it kind of just gets shoveled under the rug once we go back to quote unquote normal and um i just i kind of want to touch touch on that in regards to water like probably all of us woke up today brushed our teeth flushed our toilet made our coffee like we don't even i i, I work at a water utility i don't think about every time i turn on the tap i'm like oh that's the mccullamy river like flowing out of my tap you know but the reason all of us can even be on this conference call is because we have access to water. And unfortunately, a lot of our unhoused neighbors don't. And 
quite frankly, um, the cities and other entities aren't really doing a whole lot, or I don't think they're doing enough to get them that access. And so Ashoka, your call to action to, um, you know, house strangers, if you have room and like not monetize anything, I think really does need to extend to sanitation creatively in any way that's possible because I can't speak to too many details because uh, of my work, but let's just say it's just not enough what's being done right now is, you know, finding hotel rooms for unhoused people to help them quarantine, to help them shelter, to help them access to save water. But for example, city of Oakland, they've only rehoused about 200 people and there are thousands of people on the streets, you know? And so something I think about a lot is we have in the Bay Area this incredibly well-oiled centralized water system. Our paying water customers don't have to think about water at all. And that means that it's really easy for us not to think about the people that don't have access to water, don't have access to sanitation and sewage because also you might have running water, but then, you know, you have to use the rest where is that going to go? You know, porta potties aren't really cutting it in a lot of places, quite frankly. Um, so this is, I'm sort of brainstorming out loud too, because I, I personally haven't found a really satisfactory way of um, whether centralized or in a decentralized way, helping people have access to these really basic water and sanitation services. And I think that as we're thinking about what does resilience mean, um, not just in regards to supply chains and food, but also water, like our water comes from hundreds of miles away from the Sierra Nevada. Um, if something really drastic were to happen and that would get shut off, how many people have rainwater catchment systems in their homes? How many people, like if you live in an apartment building, you probably don't have enough land to have a tank to store enough water to have enough water to even brush your teeth for the entire year. California is a drought state. You know, we we don't have rainfall for nine months out of the year. So um, I'm kind of asking more questions than I have answers, but I think that's something that it's so easy to forget about it because so many of us have access to that resource. Yeah. Just a, a quick note on that, Anya and other people. If you do want to support efforts, to install water and sanitation and homeless encampments, get in touch with me. There are crews of people who are working on that in much the same way that we did uh, Occupy the Farm, basically hooking directly, hooking people directly up to water lines. And if anybody has access to sinks or other water infrastructure, they take donations. So yeah. I think it's a really important moment to ask ourselves how we can invest in those kind of things. Um, you know, we're starting to see the state hand out money in ways that we know are not meant to truly provide a social safety net for those of us at the bottom, but are really meant to stabilize the economy. Um, and it's really the time to start asking, like, how can we refuse to stabilize the economy and how can we reinvest those monetary resources into creating the just transition infrastructure that we collectively own and have agency over. Um, and so for those who, you know, these stimulus checks are extra money that they don't actually need um, to buy groceries or to pay the bills, um, there's a big movement of folks asking people to redistribute that money, right? What would it be for just 40 folks to take that $1,200 and invest it in the Giltrack Farms mutual aid fundraising campaign right now, right? That would be a huge, a huge benefit to them. Um, more so beyond the people that have the ability to do that, what about the folks that don't starting to band together in solidarity and choose what are those places that actually don't need that money right now, right? Does a, does a massive landlord um, that already owns 50, 60 homes, right? Do they really need that money right now or do we need to be collectively refusing to pay that money into places that stabilize an extractive economy and do we instead need to be reinvesting in water catchment systems at a community scale, um, in urban farms, right, in distribution systems that are linked to these places of production on the land. Um, so I think that's 
that's something that is a very brave step. And we're like getting together in communication with each other and trying to build that sense of strength and trust and, and courage. Um, but I think this is really the moment to start looking at that in a more serious way. Um, Christoph, you were talking about the work you're doing right now with uh, getting you know sanitation to people living on the streets. Um, can you go a little more deeply into about sort of in a nuts and bolts way for people to, you know, how do you go about setting up a, a mutual aid effort? How do you, you know, brainstorming, putting it together? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I am not directly working on that. I'm helping some people who are. Um, I think this is sort of, uh, uh, this invites a, a, a distinction. Um, between the kind of work that we're doing at the farm and the kind of work that you see being done by sort of mainstream charities in the state. Um, the people that I am connected to have longstanding relationships with folks and encampments precisely because they've been doing distribution and infrastructure work and support for people in those encampments for a very long time. So these are we're talking about people with personal relationships. We're talking about groups of people that are not, they're not going to the encampments to do service. They're going to the encampments to work alongside of people in the encampments. These are self-organized networks of people, and they exist throughout Oakland, but they're not tied into the standard sort of networks of people who do "quote unquote" outreach to the homeless. So, you know, when you see um, uh, when you see news stories about Gavin Newsom sending trailers to Oakland or people being housed in hotels, that ends up only serving and ends up only helping a very small amount of people, and um, so yeah, to get connected to people like that, you have to have longstanding relationships, which again, we have these kinds of longstanding relationships because we've been working with them. They've been coming to the farm for food. They've been doing this kind of work for a long time and we've been doing it alongside them. Um, and so these are, I mean, guess people's networks. Um, they're not formal. Uh, there's a news article about it if you want to read about it um, that just came out. You do a search for Wood Street encampment and water, um, but uh, yeah. So they're 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 actually, you know, they're addressing needs that that should be obvious to the state, right? Should be obvious to anybody. We're talking we're talking about washing our hands, washing our hands, washing our hands. Where homeless folks want to wash their hands. Well, you know, if you're working with people in an encampment and the world is talking about washing their hands, they're going to ask that question. And you're going to come up with a solution, and that's what's being installed. Um, I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about the specifics of those installations, but um, yeah, there's small networks of people who have been working on the streets for a long time, and most of them are not organized, um, most of them are not connected directly to the state, and they don't have the benefit of those resources. Um, and I think they do a lot um, better work, and I think they do a lot more efficient work than uh, the state is doing right now. No, thank you. That that's, that that does address the, my question. I, you know that these things are built off of relationships that exist. We have to look around where we are within our own sphere, not imagine some sphere that we're not in to take advantage of what we uh, of what we actually have our hands on. Gopal, it looks like you have something to say. I yeah, I just wanted to I wanted to add on to what Christoph was saying a little bit. I think that's really important to this. This is a this is actually about. Um, long-term organizing and relationship building and centering relationships um, in the work. And, and it is also never too late to start cultivating those relationships. And in moments like just as in Occupy and just as in Occupy the Farm, um, these are moments in which people um, come alive to the possibility and need um, and and should have the opportunity to engage with and, and start developing these relationships and networks by throwing down in a good way. And, and to that end, I, wanna, I just want to name that like, when you hear mutual aid, we should not translate that in our minds to some kind of charity. Like mutual aid is not a group of people getting together to go help people who, whose needs aren't being met. Mutual aid is about recognizing that the only way your needs are going to get met is by doing it together. And if you center those who are most vulnerable, more people will get their needs met. Like 
you know, the, why do we say, why is Black Lives Matter so important? Black Lives Matter is so important because when Black Lives Matter, all lives will matter. That it is, it is, it is why disability justice is so important. It's because when we stand with folks whose needs are categorically uh, excluded from value in, um, by the economy, everybody's needs get met better. And that I think is really important. And there are folks um, who are putting together resources for folks to self-organize mutual aid networks. And they're not asking people to self-organize charity efforts because FEMA isn't good enough. They're asking, they're calling on us to recognize the needs that we have that aren't getting met, to recognizing the needs in our communities that need to get met to keep us all healthy, safe, resilient, and to get organized around that. And that requires building relationships and that requires making mistakes and that requires taking responsibility for the mistakes you make and making, and making new and different mistakes every time. And, you know, so I just, I'm super with Christoph on the like, this isn't somebody wakes up one day and says, oh, I'm gonna go make sure that the homeless have water. No, this is unhoused folks getting organized with allies who all recognize that they have a common cause and figuring out the right answer to the question. And we can all get engaged in that at any given moment. Um, you know, I don't know that any of us who are on this webinar right now are folks who were um, sort of, um, who got politicized through Occupy the Farm. Like, I think we were all already doing political organizing work in different ways and were in Occupy the Farm. But we all know so many people who were. And, you know, it's like, and including my kids, you know, who are teenagers now, but who were doing civil disobedience as elementary school kids during Occupy the Farm. It's, um, so I, I just want to say these moments are opportunities for us to like, you know, um, to organize people into these opportunities and people are being self-organized right now, are self-organizing into these, this moment right now. I think, um, I think we cannot, um, uh, we, we cannot ignore the quiet revolution that is happening, um, which is people are saying to themselves, are asking themselves, their everyday people are saying, what kind of an asshole kicks people out of their apartment right now? Which we need to organize that sentiment into a rent strike, because guess what? The biggest landlord on the planet is a fucking hedge fund, right? Like that's the issue. And you know, it, it's, it pe but people, people are in their hearts recognizing that like there's a moral imperative here. We decided to subordinate commerce to health and well-being because we, we knew that 1.2 million people could die just in the United States. We decided on a dime to shut down commerce. And if we had planned it and thought it through, we could have minimized the negative externalities, the negative consequences, and we could have maximized the benefits. So this is our opportunity to take advantage of the benefits, to self-organize our way into meeting people's needs, continue to do that. It may, it may be the turning point, it may not, but it's certainly an opportunity to build more power, to bring more folks into, um, a new way of thinking to build on the feelings people are having right now about what it means, what our priorities are, what we care about, who we care about. Yeah, sorry. No, that was really nicely said, Gopal. I think you really, really put it, put it very well. But I would like to talk about the law because you've raised, oh, you've all raised points here where this comes into conflict with the law. Occupy the Farm was an act of civil disobedience. Uh, Gopal, you and Effie were arrested at Occupy the Farm. The, the law seems to be very flexible uh, when it comes to who has the power. You guys got arrested for trespassing, but the University of California who administers this land was able to ignore its charter and, and its legal obligations. Um, we've seen this across the country now where oil companies and pipeline companies are, are, are making protest of an oil pipeline a felony. 
um, even when that pipeline is going to cross your land. And it's the, the flexibility of the law on, uh, on the side of the powerful, it seems to be maximal. And the, and the enforcement of the law against the rest of everybody else is, uh, is, is quite strict. It's called being black in America. Welcome to the reality. It's fun, isn't it? <laughs> Great. Great. <laughs> Don't stress out. You've only been black for six weeks. Don't worry. <laughs> Got two years on you. <laughs> so I, we, I have the feeling that this is going to get worse before it gets better. So are, are we going to be able to do anything to, uh, I, I would like to have everyone's views as to, 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 to what extent is it going to be necessary to uh, be, in, be outlaws to confront climate change, to confront, to, to, to construct what we need to construct. Um, I think, I think personally, like, I think something that Occupy the Farm taught me and just my work subsequently, like the point of challenging the state is like the secondary consideration. Like the first consideration is asking those around me what they actually need. And that is the, builds the capacity to develop the relationships that could support any sort of political action that would require some sort of illegality. I think that like, what I see happening right now where like people in apartments are just being like actually knowing their neighbors and being like, what do you need right now? And it's like, Hey, I need like two hours away from my kids. And it's like, okay, cool. I got you. And like those like little steps, I think it's so much less in this moment about trying to convince people about an idea like that. It just seems so irrelevant and kind of like grandstandy in a way that I think, is just is just like very antiquated in the way that I feel like organizing needs to happen now. Like I feel like my priorities are like understanding what people are need, needing. Like in my community, like I was going through a bunch of city documents and recognized that like 70% of my community is senior citizens and they like have no Meals on Wheels program. So like one of the first things I want to do is have a Meals on Wheels program. And it doesn't have to be like everything is political. It doesn't have to be like I don't have to be like, fuck yeah, food sovereignty. And if you don't support food sovereignty, you're a fascist. Like, I think like scaling it back a little bit and just like in, in our capacity to provide for other people, we will show that we're the right way because like we're really just, like the foil is literally a system that's like, well, I don't care if 1.2 million people die because I need the stock market to go up. And so on that, like in the, like, uh, being a foil or a mirror to that level of like just general like devaluation of life, I think it's really easy for us to come away with like a moral legitimacy as long as we're just providing for ourselves and each other. And that's the most politically empowering thing that I think that these mutual aid networks can do, right? Is these mutual aid uh, networks of relationship, what they're secondarily doing in addition to creating a way that we can make sure each other's needs are getting met is they're creating webs of trust. And it's through those webs of trust that we can take risks and we can go up against laws that um, are limiting people from getting their needs met in the current moment and limiting us from transitioning to a better, more regenerative, more just, more resilient way of living. Um, that's what allowed us to, you know, cut the lock on the fence at the Gill Tract and stay there together for three weeks was that we'd taken some months, some of us some years, to build these webs of trust. Um, and those webs of trust aren't just about knowing each other, they're about mutual aid. They're about knowing that, oh, when I experience houselessness, you know, Effie's gonna let me uh, have a room to stay in for a few nights. Oh, when, you know, um, Christoph, you know, needs, needs support because he's broken down on the side of the road, like Ashoka is going to drive out and pick him up. And we're not going to let each other fall through the cracks of an extractive economic system. We're going to meet each other's needs. And then through that trust building, um, through that mutual aid, that's when we can take risks and, and cut through the lock on a fence or um, go on rent strike together or any number of things that further our collective interests. Um, I have a... Go ahead. I have a little, little bit to add because I think that we're in a pretty unique situation, and 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 um, you know, there's a a, a certain uh, amount of the the markets are failing as a way to get people 
what they need. And I mean that from, you know, from the oil market to the housing market to the supermarket. And we're talking about a, a situation right now where the need is absolutely unprecedented. Somebody that needs to eat is going to find food. And if that means they have to shoplift that food, they're going to shoplift that food. And I understand that as a political action. I understand that as a direct action. And I mean, I think it's already happening. I think it's going to continue to happen. I don't, I don't see this as a situation where the state is increasing in its control or its ability to limit these things. I see it at a time when the state is actually loosening its grip because it realizes that if it holds rigid, it's going to break like a matchstick. And that has to do with the housing market. I mean, you see the, the, the ways that people have, the, the state has already moved to curtail landlords' ability to evict people, curtail their ability to charge late fees, charge rent. Mortgages are basically gone. You know, if you want them, you don't need them, you need to pay your mortgage for a year. These are the state. This isn't a bunch of like direct action anarchists running out there, you know, saying organizing a rent strike. You know, as much as we want to be conceited and like pat ourselves on the back for the term, like the state is asking, telling people, hey, if you can't pay your rent, we'll work it out. And that's because they realize that on the other side of that is default and on the other side of that is total financial collapse. And, you know, in light of that, a lot of things that we've talked about and we've done at, you know, at Occupy the Farm and what we've been doing at the Guild Track, like people need to ask themselves what's going to happen if the marketplace stops being a place where you can get what you need. You know, in the future, if there isn't a housing market, how are you going to find a place to live? If there isn't a real estate market, how are you going to find a place to farm? If there isn't a supermarket, how are you going to get your food? Right? Because all of these places are governed by money and all of these places, their motive is to shut down. Their motive, if you can't pay rent, is to evict you and to have an empty unit. Their motive is to have a bunch of land sitting on the market waiting for a buyer. Their motive is to have a bunch of food sitting in a warehouse waiting for someone who's actually going to give them money for it. So as that, as that stops happening, these places are going to actually shut down. We're going to have to do, you know, what Gopal always talks about is like building the replacement for these, even as we're, we're as the rules governing these markets uh, start to break down. We've been uh, on the air for about 90 minutes and I would like to uh, go around and if, if anyone has got anything else to say and also, because this this quarantine time has been such a uh, personal thing i mean we are animals you know we're we're, we're creatures we're social creatures we we miss our pack you know all these things this has had a lot of you know we think personally as well as politically um in closing do, do, does anyone i'd like to hear what people what they're feeling like and if, if they've come to any realizations that they would like to share I mean, very briefly, I'll just share that I, I haven't really farmed a whole lot since the year or so after the initial Occupy the Farm action. And this is the first year that I am growing things from seed and working the soil in our backyard. And it's so, so thrilling. And so I'm just so like reflecting on the action and the fact that all of the waves of people that came after the initial action, those of you that have stayed really involved with the farm. Um, I'm so thrilled that that's a place where people all over the Bay Area can theoretically come and do those same things and smell soil and touch compost and plant seedlings. And um, because it is, it is truly a calming thing to do the, to the, for the nervous system on a sensorial level it's calming and uh, re-energizing to be working together with people. And um, I'm just really happy to have not only reconnected with all of you, but to know exactly what the farm needs right now in terms of being able to make it an open space since it is a essential, very essential service um, so that people can come and keep experiencing this during this pandemic and beyond. Um, because it is a, a life-giving thing to be able to work in soil. 
Anybody else? Um, I'll go next um, and to, to close out. Um, I just want to say, because it's kind of funny, that um, the last thing I heard before my audio cut out was Christoph saying, as Gopal always says. So I think that's kind of funny because I have no idea what I always say, <laughs> um, nor do I want to know. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that because I also think it's kind of a fun reflection on our, on our friendship. <laughs> um, uh, but I live in an intentional community. I've been living in this community basically my entire adult life. My children were born and raised in it. And, um, and I think, you know, I've always believed in the importance and the resilience of that. But in this moment, it is in stark relief for me what it means to live with a whole bunch of other people in a multi-generational space, um, to be able to um, care for each other, to be able to... Um, look out for each other and what capacity that gives us to participate in looking out for and being active in the larger community um, and what um, opportunities that also affords, um, how that has a ex extending effect. <clears throat> and I, um, you know, I think this, this is really important and something that I'm very um, concerned about is the way the term social distancing, which should be called physical distancing, is gets conflated to mean um, isolation, the way people use the term lockdown. There's a whole bunch of language. Um, people use the term social isolation. Like the, this I think is an, an incredibly dangerous um, way to frame the moment that we're in. This is an opportunity for us to actually be very social and community oriented, um, and it will. Look, and I don't. I do not mean video calls. I mean finding creative ways to be out in our communities with each other, um, and um, and to um, assess the needs that we all have, um, and meet them. And I think um, I just want to encourage us to like you know, to think of the physical distancing as social solidarity. And the better we are at flattening the curve, the longer this thing lasts, and the greater an opportunity we have to develop some new muscle memory, right? Like that is what it means to flatten the curve. It means to stretch this whole thing out. And ideally, at the, as we are doing it, we are flattening the curve of inequality that inequitably distributes the consequences of these moments. Um, because right now it's all traveling the well-worn paths of inequality. Um, and um, we, we need to grapple with that as much as everything else. So just want to, um, and just want to really appreciate seeing you all and being in conversation. This has been great. Uh, it's been great seeing all of you. It's been very, uh, it's been very uplifting and I, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, everyone's effort. Um, Do you want to take some questions? Is that yeah, because I just I just saw all these people and some people are raising their hands and stuff. Uh, I tell you what, Ryan, can you see the questions? Where do we see the questions? I saw I saw Bronwyn raise, raise her hand. Hit Q and A in the bottom middle of the screen. Oh yes, there we go. Is it, is it okay if I allow somebody to talk? I can see that. I can see how. I yeah, can. I think you can allow someone to. Okay. Please do. All right. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow Bronwyn to ask a question. Hi, Bronwyn. Hi. I'm just here with Mimoy. She just wanted to give our appreciation and love and how much we miss the farm. And we want to plant seeds. And we have a bunch of seeds that we want to give to you guys. So. Yay. Hi, Bronwyn. That's, Hi. that's that. We just wanted to have our voice heard and how much we just are so appreciative of everyone's action and we really miss being there so much we talk about it almost every day oh sweet sweet yeah, yeah. Nimway Nimway is is part of um a group called elf the emergent learning flock which is a group of kids that farms in the ladybug peace and justice patch at the gill tract and they are some of the most skilled farmers that we have on the land actually so yeah the, the farm that Nimoy's built at our house here is just amazing she's got so many skills so thank you for that <laughs> awesome <laughs> is there anything else 
I can't see. I just want to read all of the wonderful kudos that people are typing. Folks are saying this is awesome. Great job. Let's grow food everywhere. And someone said that we are all very loved and thanking us for everything that we do. And so it's nice to hear from folks that have been tuning in. So uh, as far as conducting our life uh, um, on Zoom calls, you know, I'm, I'm not totally skilled at running Zoom. I mean, before this uh, webinar that we're running, the only thing I've done on Zoom is have cocktails with people in distant places. So um, I, am, I am very appreciative to, to those of you who actually know how to use this device. <laughs> so uh, if we're done, I'm just gonna repeat that people can send donations to this web address. Fieldtechfund.org. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Todd. And if anybody else has any questions, you can just hit the little raise your hand. Yeah, there's two folks raising their hands right now, actually. Oh, great. James, I'm going to allow you, you to talk, James. I'm going to push the button. Here you go. Hi, James. Hello. Thanks for having me. This has been awesome. Um, I just had some questions in regards like I had already asked the question in the, in the box, but I kind of wanted some further details about what community farms can do to still be like, you know, have community involvement during these times. And basically the balance between physical distancing and having people around the farm. Like I know it's way more effective if everyone's wearing masks, not if just one person's wearing masks. So just kind of like some protocol along, around that. Cause I've had some friends questioning shutting down their community farm during this time. Yeah, um, so I'll just say this, what we've been, our protocol is that um, we're asking everybody, oh, Ashok is back in the medicinal garden. Hey. <laughs> you better so, change apart. <laughs> <laughs> um, so gloves give a false sense of security. So don't don't worry about gloves unless you're there to protect you, like gardening gloves or work gloves. Um, just wash your hands a lot and wear a mask to to remind you to keep you to, from touching your face. Not necessarily to again, it's not it could be a false sense of security if you think it's going to keep everything in and out. But the masks helps you remember. Oh, I'm touching my face, but it has to be a well fitted mask. Otherwise, you're going to be touching it all the time to move it around. Um, so wash your hands for 20 seconds often. Uh, sanitize the things that you touch between uses. So the, the any trays that you have, try to use trays that you can sanitize. Hand, hydrogen peroxide works great, 3%. Just spraying everything down and letting it dry in the sun, preferably. Um, so tool handles, things you're carrying food in. Don't wash the produce, just tell people to wash it when they get home, because the less you can contact it, another reason why why local food systems is good because it's fewer hands that it's moving through before it gets to your plate. Um, but yeah, just don't, don't bother washing it. Just try to get it right. If you can even harvest it right into the bag that the person is going to take home, that's even better. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions out there? I really liked what uh, Gopal, I believe it was Gopal who said that the longer the chain of distribution, the greater inequity or something, like words to that effect. And, and the, the fact that the farm is shortening the- Ashoka. Ashoka said that. Uh, I that, probably I agree. Go I, anyways, I, so I agree. <laughs> <laughs> who knows where the idea started? It's probably Gopal. <laughs> But you know, it it seems like you know, as as we're just going to design our um, our future, that that has to be that these sorts of issues have to be taken into account, you know, in the design, in the DNA of what we do. And um, occupy the farm uh, was for me so uh, instrumental in, in in bringing this idea. It's like you know, you had to you you really have to design your desires and your end goals into the thing you're doing right from the get go. It, there can't be some kind of like weird distance between what you want and what you're actually doing. And uh, so unless anyone else has anything to say, I think we'll end this. And I think this has been very successful. It's great seeing you all. Oh, and I, I want to plug one thing. Yes. 
I highly encourage people to read Emergent Strategy. It's a great framework for social change. It's on the desk. I love it. We didn't even plan that. Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. Highly recommended. It's all about working with natural systems as we design and envision our own futures. Hold that book up again. Can book up all. He can't hear me. Okay. <laughs> Emergent Strategy. All right. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else? Anyone? Ryan, Anya, Effie, Christoph, Gopal. Um, I definitely want to encourage people to look around them and see uh, what's available. Um, I know that there are people now, especially in Los Angeles, who are uh, cracking, well, actually and the Bay Area, who are cracking open empty apartments, housing that isn't being used. Um, this is a great way, great time to do it. You're basically bolstering whatever meager attempts the state is making to house the unhoused folks um, through the shelter in place. That's uh, um, uh, completely in keeping with what we did at the farm. I think the same thing goes uh, is true for um, for community gardens and empty lots. Everyone's talking about victory gardens, and starting victory gardens. Victory gardens are community gardens, and they should be started everywhere. If you've got empty space on your block or you've got a place that you could plant, like we always talked about, uh, one of the goals for what we did at, at with the farm, uh, with Occupy the Farm, was for to inspire other people to go out and try this. And I think they're actually – you know, uh, Todd's uh, uh, feelings about the state, looming state repression to the notwithstanding, I think now is a really, really good time to actually try that. I mean, if people can't see the point or the logic behind housing people who need housing and, 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 and growing our own food so we don't depend on, on, on um, overwhelmed food, uh, food distribution systems and markets, then I don't know when when that is going <laughs> to when they're going to come to that realization. So go out and uh, take it. <clears throat> this is uh, this session has given me a lot of optimism to, uh, to, to imagine this, that this is a moment of, of uh, some revolutionary potential that we're looking at opportunities. Mm -hmm. We're not looking at disaster solely. And uh, so here's to everyone's health and everyone's opportunity.